uh, topic today uh, is, is going to be, or our speaker is going to be uh, introduced by uh, Bob Holmes. But I think as, as one growing up in the 50s and going to the 25 cent movies and you know learning American history through those movies, and I, I certainly came away with one you know kind of set of viewpoints about you know who Indians were. You know, one of them, they, they all wore war bonnets when they were in fights. You know, I mean, which apparently was not the case. Uh, that uh, they were savages. Uh, the uh, the white guys always ended up winning, and you know, and then so that was kind of where my movie perspective kind of ended, and then later movies kind of showed a number of other things. So movies were important, are important in terms of what we know. Well, uh, Bob, introduce our wonderful speaker because uh, he is uh, someone very important on the scene and very knowledgeable about this subject. And we have a lighting expert uh, that has arrived from the library. She's bringing, uh, she's going to bring light to the subject. And, uh, you know, yeah, this is always, this is, working with the library has been a wonderful learning experience. And so we didn't know, they have a division of lighting and, and Betty is the head of that division. So. <laughs> she doesn't know what she's doing. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure and a privilege to introduce our speaker for today, and uh, we uh, certainly welcome each one of you, ladies and gentlemen, wanting all, and uh, for a, touring our exhibit and our lectures that you've been. So uh, with that, I'll uh, introduce uh, Jack Edmondson. He's a recognized historian and author and uh, magazine article, several books, most, uh, you know, notably the Alamo story, and we have uh, copies out there. And in appreciation of many of his contributions here in Texas, well, Jack was uh, uh, kind of uh, elected as an honorary member of the Sons of the Republic of Texas, and Governor Perry recognized him as an admiral of the Texas Navy. So uh, he now serves as our chair to the Texas Historical uh, Commission, and among his other things, why well, he and his wife Susan have uh, the horses and uh, cats and dogs that's appropriate for our here. Without further ado, uh, let's put our hands together for our speaker, Jack. Well, thank you very much. I uh, <clears throat> I volunteered for this, but I really don't think I'm probably the most appropriate person to give this talk. Um, you've probably heard some uh, academic and scholarly discussions here earlier. Um, but let's let somebody who was there do this talk. And I can guarantee you it won't be academic or scholarly, but hopefully it won't be tedious. I'm gonna tell you something. Want you to listen tight. Well, the Indians are on the warpath again. They're complaining about how they've been treated in the movies. I've been talking to them, and they've got some basic complaints. First, well, they say they've never been portrayed authentically as real people. They're always stereotyped, either noble savages or brutal sadistic savages. Either way, they are stoic to the point of being stiff. They speak in childlike single syllables with lots of hows and uggs thrown in. Kind of makes them seem simple-minded. Well, I know a lot of cowboys who feel that they've never been portrayed authentically either. 
Seems they're often stereotyped as good guys or bad guys. Sometimes they talk kind of funny, too. By the way, well, I'd be grateful if I could speak Comanche in single syllables. Hell, I'd be grateful if I could speak it at all. Second, the Indians complain that the movies have not portrayed them with historical accuracy. Often their cultures are confused. You'll see woods Indians wearing headdresses, or you'll see teepees in the backwoods, and, well, the white men just don't seem to appreciate the differences in the Indian tribes and cultures. Well, I don't think that situation is particularly unique either. Hell, screenwriters are notorious for not doing their homework, whatever they're writing. And anyway, well, Hollywood has never let a little thing like accuracy stand in the way of a good story. Third, well, the Indians resent the fact that more often than not, they have been portrayed in the movies by non-Indian actors. Well, I don't think that charge is completely fair either. Because the problem is, well, there just weren't a lot of real Indians back in Hollywood in those days. And I mean real actors, people who studied their craft, knew how to memorize and deliver their lines. When there was such a fella, like a Mohawk named Jay Silverheels, well, he got used a whole lot. He was the first Indian inducted into the Screen Actors Hall of Fame. During the 60s, Jay established the Indian Actors Workshop. It brought a lot more Indians to Hollywood and helped train them. But it also became politicized, kind of radical. Ironically, some of those Indians began blaming Jay for the way Indians were depicted in the movies. A fourth complaint was that even when the Indians were good guys, they were often relegated to being just sidekicks. Since Jay had portrayed the most popular faithful Indian companion ever, he was getting a lot of the blame. The term Tonto became the Indian equivalent to Uncle Tom. And one more thing. A whole lot of Indians blame me for the way they're portrayed on the screen. And I don't think that's fair either. Indians were a part of our history. I have never shown them as anything but courageous and with great human dignity. Why, I can't imagine any Indian not realizing that I did as much to give them a fine image on the screen as anyone else who ever worked in the pictures. At least that's what I've always thought. But let's be fair. Let's look back over some of Hollywood's biggest pictures that depicted the Indians. Let's see if we can observe any trends and agree or disagree on what the Indians were claiming. The Bank Robbery was the first known dramatic movie to feature an Indian made around 1907, the year I was born. They made the picture in Cache, Oklahoma. Filmmakers were moving west, in part to get out from under the patents that Thomas Edison had filed back in New Jersey, in part to find summer, sunnier climates that would allow year-round filming. Well, Oklahoma, didn't have any movie stars. Weren't any movie stars back then. Oklahoma offered the real thing. The good guys were played by real live U.S. Marshals, such as Bill Tillman, Heck Thomas, and Chris Madsen. The leader of the bad guys was a real live bank robber, now reformed, named Al Jennings. 
There weren't any Indian fights in the picture, but a real live Indian played a good guy, joined the posse that tracked down the bank robbers. And he was the man of the hour today, the real live Quanah Parker, just a few years before his death. The very first major full-length picture about Indians was the 1920 version of Last of the Mohicans. And just like the James Fenimore Cooper novel it was based on, the Indians are either good, the Mohicans, or bad, led by the bloodthirsty Huron Magua. The picture introduces another sort of tradition, sort of became a cliché. Those were racially sensitive years. Would be for most of the 20th century. In a picture, if folks from different races fell in love, you almost always knew their relationship was doomed. Either the man or the woman were going to die. In Last of the Mohicans, the noble Mohican brave Uncas falls in love with the beautiful Anglo maiden Cora. Well, this time they both die. One more thing about this story. Well, the hero is a white man, a fella called Hawkeye. He was raised by the Mohicans, and he learned to be better than they are at just about everything. He could speak their language, but he could speak English too. And when he did, well, he sounded like an educated man, and he had white skin. Don't you know that kind of raised the ire of the Indians? Of course, Cooper knew that most of the folks who read his book were white. Most of the folks who bought tickets to the movies were white. Having a white hero was more an economic issue than it was a racial one. Now consider the Vanishing American, released in 1925. It was based on a book by Zane Gray, George B. Seitz, best known for a Pearl White serial, directed the silent picture in the epic style of Cecil B. DeMille. The film followed Native Americans from prehistoric times until after World War I. Each early group was defeated by a more advanced tribe. Especially memorable was the attack by early Indians against primitive cliff dwellers. The spectacular scene incorporated a cast of thousands. Just before the leader of the cliff dwellers dies, he curses the enemy chief, warning him that one day his people too will fall. Sure enough, then the Spanish come with gunpowder and horses. And then a couple centuries later, the Indians are fighting Kit Carson and the U.S. Cavalry, complete with artillery. And all of that is just an introduction to the picture. The main story finally begins telling us about Navajos confined to a reservation dealing with a corrupt Indian agent played by the wonderfully evil Noah Berry. The good news, as far as the Indian critics are concerned, is that the hero is a Navajo Indian, a fella named Nofi. The bad news, he's played by a white man, Richard Dix. Nofi actually leads his group of Navajos into World War I. They become heroes, and after the war, return to their reservation, only to find out that the corruption is even worse than before. Let me tell you about Richard Dix. He was a good-looking and talented fella whose cinematic career continued well into the sound era. He played Yancey Kravitz in the 1931 version of Cimarron. In later pictures, he would portray such significant characters as 
Sam Houston, and Wyatt Earp. Now, not all the whites in this picture are bad fellas. The good ones include Mary Ann Warner, the beautiful schoolmarm, who teaches the Indian children on the reservation. She and Novi fall in love, which is kind of unfortunate, because you know one of them's not going to make it. Except for Dix, most of the Navajo are played by real live Navajo. However, a brave named Showy was portrayed by a fella named Charles Stevens. He was a half Mexican, half Apache, and the grandson of the great Geronimo. And he had a long career in Hollywood himself. One more thing about Vanishing American. It was filmed on location in some of the most dramatically beautiful areas of the Southwest, including the Grand Canyon and Monument Valley. That was nearly a decade and a half before John Ford rediscovered Monument Valley for a picture called Stagecoach. Now that's the picture that kind of made me a star. But it's also a, the picture that a lot of Indians blame for the way they're portrayed in Hollywood. John Ford once said that he had probably killed more Indians than anyone since Custer. And since my character, the Ringo Kid, was the fella sitting up on top of that stagecoach with a Winchester carbine, I was the one doing most of the killing for Pappy. In fact, well, the Indians aren't the real villains in Stagecoach. Luke Plummer and his brothers are the real bad guys. They murdered the Ringo kid's brother, framed the kid for the crime. Ringo was riding on that coach to Lordsburg to confront the plumbers. The showdown is the real climax of the picture. At the start of the picture, it's revealed that Geronimo is on the warpath. They might as well announce that a hurricane was approaching. The threat of an Apache attack hangs over the picture like gathering storm clouds. There's a quick close-up of an Apache leader. Well, it might be Geronimo. In fact, he and all the rest of the Apaches are portrayed by the local Navajo. But the Indians in Stagecoach are never personified, never humanized. They are relegated to being a force of nature, an obstacle to be overcome by both the stagecoach and, well, symbolically, the white man's western migration. When the attack comes, well, it's a spectacular running battle across the desert. Some critics, not just the Indians, have observed that real-life Apaches would have shot the horses pulling the coach. John Ford's response was, that would have made for a much shorter movie. <laughs> Ford showed even less respect for the Indians in My Darling Clementine, released in 1946. Of course, this wasn't a picture about Indians at all. It was Ford's version of the Wyatt Earp legend, with Henry Fonda in the starring role. However, in a very early scene, Wyatt has to go into a saloon and apprehend a drunken Indian, a fella named Indian Joe, who's shooting up the place. After completing his task, Wyatt mutters, what kind of town is this, selling whiskey to the Indians? That line didn't win Ford any points with the Indians. Well, the drunken Indian in Clementine was played by Charles Stevens, grandson of Geronimo. Now, interestingly, as a character named Indian Charlie, Stevens appeared in virtually the identical scene 
In an earlier version of the Earp Saga, 1939's Frontier Marshal starring Randolph Scott. And in 1942, Stevens played Indian Charlie again in Tombstone, The Town Too Tough to Die, the picture in which Richard Dix portrayed Wyatt Earp. At least all these pictures were using a real Indian. John Ford was back in Monument Valley two years later, 1948, for Fort Apache. Now this picture transplanted the Custer story to the southwest with Apaches, again portrayed by the local Navajos, standing in for the Sioux and Cheyenne. Lieutenant Colonel Owen Thursday, portrayed by Henry Fonda, was the Custer figure, a fellow whose arrogance and hatred for the red men brings about the destruction of his entire command. I played a fellow named Captain Kirby York, who understands the plight of the Apaches, a man who describes the Indian Bureau in Washington as the dirtiest, most corrupt group in the history, a man the Indians trust. Captain York arranges a meeting between Colonel Thursday and the Apache Chief Cochise, portrayed by a fine Mexican actor named Miguel Inclan. Through an interpreter, Cochise tells Colonel Thursday, the Apaches are a great race, never been conquered. But it is not well for a nation to be always at war. The young men die. The women sing sad songs, and the old ones are hungry in the winter. And so I led my people from the hills. We looked to the great white father for protection. He gave us slow death. If there will be war, for each one of us that you kill, ten white men will die. Well, Colonel Thursday perceives this statement as a challenge to his own honor and to the honor of the United States. It compels him to lead his command into their ill-fated last stand. Because Captain York protested Thursday's strategy in the impending battle, he was left behind with a wagon train to survive and to preserve Thursday's reputation and the reputation of the cavalry. In the final scene, Captain York, now promoted to colonel, is interviewed by some reporters. They ask him about the forgotten troopers who died with Thursday. York replies, well, they aren't forgotten because they haven't died. And they'll keep on living as long as the regiment lives. The pay is $13 a month their diet, beans and hay. Maybe horse meat before this campaign is over. They'll fight over cards or rot gut whiskey, but share the last drop in their canteens. The faces may change, the names, but they're there, the regiment, the regular army, now and 50 years from now. Fort Apache was an homage to the U.S. Cavalry. The real conflict in the picture existed between Thursday and York. The Indians were only an element of the story. At least this time, they had faces and names and dignity. She wore a yellow ribbon, released the following year, 1949, as yet another even more sentimental, Portrait of the Cavalry. It's a beautiful film and one of my favorite roles. I portray Captain Nathan Brittles, a fellow on the verge of retirement, about to lose the only home he can remember, the U.S. Army. To avert an Indian war, I ride into the Indian village to meet with the old chief, Pony That Walks. He is played by a real-life Seneca chief. 
Chief John Bigtree and his long film career dated back to 1913. He had even a small part in Stagecoach. Nathan Brittles and Pony That Walks have a history. They have fought against each other and they've learned to respect each other. Unlike Thursday and Cochise, Nathan and the old chief can talk and communicate. Nathan tells Pony That Walks of the futility of the coming conflict, <clears throat> but the chief responds that it is too late, Nathan, too late. The young bucks want to fight. With the final seconds of his enlistment ticking away, Captain Brittles assembles his troops. They stampede the Indian horses, forcing the Indians back to the reservation, ending the war before it begins and without any bloodshed. Now, the only thing I can think of in this picture that might offend Indians is the fact that Ben Johnson, as Sergeant Tyree, rides better than they do. But hell, Ben Johnson could ride better than just about anybody. To most Indians, the turning point regarding their treatment in Hollywood came with the August 1950 release of Delmer Dave's Broken Arrow. Many claim this is the first motion picture to depict Indians as real human beings. Loosely based on a true story, well, the picture tells how white man Tom Jeffords, played by my good friend Jimmy Stewart, rode bravely and alone into the Apache stronghold to discuss peace with Cochise. The two men develop a mutual respect that turns into a warm friendship. Together, they're able to bring about a peace treaty between the Apache and the whites. But as Cochise says, to talk of peace is not hard. To live it is very hard. There are renegade Indians, most notably Geronimo, played by Jay Silverheels, who had just begun his eight-year run as Tonto, on the Lone Ranger TV series. And then there were always evil and corrupt white men. Jeffords marries an Indian maiden. And you know how that's going to turn out. But somehow, after much violence and tragedy, Jeffords and Cochise are still holding the peace together at the fade out. Indian critics found a couple of offensive things in Broken Arrow. Coach East was played by a white man, Jeff Chandler. Chandler actually garnered an Oscar nomination for the role. Didn't matter. He was white. In fact, Chandler and Silverheels reprised their roles as Coach East and Geronimo in a prequel made a couple years later, Battle at Apache Pass. And Chandler played Cochise two years after that in Taza, Son of Cochise, starring another white fella, Rock Hudson. And there's another, another little problem with Broken Arrow. The title comes from the action of breaking an arrow in two to symbolize peace. But the Apaches never did that. The broken arrow was actually a symbol used by the Blackfeet Indians up along the Canadian border. The Devil's Doorway was another pro-Indian picture released in September 1950, only a couple of months after Broken Arrow. It would be director Anthony Mann's first Western. He would later do a lot of work with Jimmy Stewart. 
This time, Robert Taylor played the lead, Lance Poole, a Shoshone who had won a Medal of Honor during the war between the states. As in Vanishing American, Poole returns to his native home to confront evil whites determined to drive the Indians from their land. And it's a beautiful land. The picture was made in the shadow of the Maroon Bells near Aspen, Colorado. Seneca chief John Bigtree, who we last saw as Pony Who Walks in Yellow Ribbon, plays a doomed Indian named Thundercloud. It would be his last role. There are no happy endings in Devil's Doorway. And the powerful climax, it is Poole and his fellow braves who make a last stand against the whites in defense of their home. And the Indians lose again in the more traditional Hondo, released in 1953. John Farrow directed, but I produced the picture, and more than any other, it reflected my own personal empathy for the Indians. The character I play, Army Scout Hondo Lane, is part Indian. He was married to an Indian woman who had died. Hondo understands the anger and frustration of the Apache chief Vittorio after the whites have once again violated the treaty. Well, there's no word for lie in the Apache language, Hondo says, and we have lied to him. By the way, Vittorio is played by Australian-born Michael Pate, who played quite a few Indians in his long career. After the final battle, in which the Apache are defeated, Hondo remarks, it is the end of a way of life, and a good one. Unlike Hondo Lane, Army Scout Ed Bannon hates Indians in the picture Arrowhead, also released in 1953. And Apache leader Toriano hates the white eyes with equal passion. Since Charlton Heston plays Bannon and Jack Palance plays Toriano, well, the performances are pretty strong. Most of the whites oppose Bannon and sympathize with the Indians. But Toriano betrays that trust, sometimes at the cost of white lives, in this picture that, well, at least briefly, reversed the Hollywood trend toward favorable depiction of the Indians. Comanche, released in March of 56, was a poor imitation of Broken Arrow. I only include it here because, well, instead of Cochise, the Indian chief who agrees to peace is Quanah Parker. Unfortunately, Quanah was rather ludicrously portrayed by white character actor Kent Smith. <clears throat> and Dana Andrews, as Indian scout Jim Reed, was no Jimmy Stewart. German-born Henry Brandon plays Black Cloud, the renegade Indian who opposes both of them. And there are bad white men, too. They give the picture some balance. At the climax, as Quana makes his peace treaty with the U.S. Army, he declares, from where the sun now stands, we will fight no more forever. Well, as any student of history knows, Quana Parker never said those words. Those were the words of Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce Indians after their defeat. The Searchers was released about the same time as Comanche, 
March 1956. Ford's beloved Monument Valley doubles for the Texas Plains, and the local Navajo portray the Comanches. The picture is significant because it is usually regarded as John Ford's finest western. And the lead character, Ethan Edwards, usually regarded as my finest performance. The picture is also significant because the script is very loosely based on the Cynthia Ann Parker story. Debbie Edwards, the character based on Cynthia Ann, is portrayed by Lana Wood at the age of 10 when the Comanches massacre her family and carry her away. Lana's more famous sister, Natalie, assumes the role when Debbie is 15. Now, Indians do not like this picture because of its strong racial overtones. Ethan Edwards hates the Indians. He understands their culture, and he still hates them. Hates them with an irrational passion. He shoots the eyes out of a dead Indian to keep the brave from being able to find his way to the happy hunting ground. Ethan even feels disgust toward one-eighth Cherokee, Martin Pauley, portrayed by Jeffrey Hunter, who joins him on the five-year quest to find Debbie. Of course, well, that's the whole point of the picture. In Arrowhead, Bannon's hatred is partially justified by Toriano's betrayal. But in the searchers, you never get that feeling of justification. It's not just the Indian critics. Well, the whole audience is somewhat repelled by Ethan's hatred. And that is what Ford was trying to do. Now, Edward's hatred is never explained. But Ford provides one very subtle clue if you were looking close. Before the massacre, we see little Debbie hiding behind a gravestone. Written on the stone are the words, Here lies Mary Jane Edwards, killed by Comanches May 12, 1852, a good wife and mother in her 41st year. When Ethan and Martin finally find Debbie, well, it's too late. She has already grown up enough to become the wife of the Comanche chief Scar, portrayed by German-born Henry Brandon, who was starting to make a career out of playing Comanches. In fact, Scar is virtually a mirror image of Ethan. He hates whites because they had killed his sons. At this point, Ethan no longer wants to rescue Debbie, and Debbie does not want to seem to want to be rescued. To Ethan, she's become impure, and now he wants to kill her too. In the climax, Martin kills Scar. Ethan relents and spares Debbie. Debbie relents and goes back with him to the welcoming arms of her extended family. The picture ends there. We assume Debbie will be successfully assimilated back into white society, unlike the tragic Cynthia Ann, who essentially had to endure a second captivity. Ford is much less optimistic in Two Road Together, released in 1961. The two men who ride together are Jimmy Stewart as a somewhat corrupt marshal, Guthrie McCabe, and Richard Widmark as a by-the-book army lieutenant named Jim Gary. In the first half of the picture, they accomplish their assigned mission to locate the Comanches and negotiate the release of white captives. Our favorite German Indian, Henry Brandon, briefly appears as Juana Parker. 
not nearly as warm a fellow as when Kent Smith played him in Comanche. Another Indian, Stone Calf, is portrayed by the wonderful African-American actor, Woody Strode. McCabe and Gary secure the release of a Mexican woman, Elena, played by the lovely Linda Cristal. But an older white woman and a younger one with children refuse to be rescued. A half-mad captive boy also resists, but McCabe and Guthrie force him to go with them. The second half of the picture deals with a return to white civilization. The two rescued captives do not receive the warm welcome that Debbie got in the searchers. The social ladies at the fort snub Elena because, well, she'd been dirtied by the Indians. The boy suffers a more tragic fate. He murders a white woman who thinks that she's the boy's mother. White settlers drag the screaming, uncomprehending boy to a tree and lynch him. Ultimately, in two rode together, the whites fare much worse than the Indians. Now, the searchers was the last time I would really fight the Indians. Well, there were enough bad guys in the West to keep me occupied. But Indians would continue to play significant roles in some of my later westerns. McClinic, released in 63 and produced by my company Batjack, was primarily a comedy. But it also has a very it also was a very personal picture, and it expressed a lot of my views, including my notions toward the Indians. George Washington McClinic is a wealthy cattle baron who owns a huge spread and most of the town that bears his name. At one time, he had fought against the Comanches. He earned their respect, and they earned his. There are three prominent Indian roles in McClinic. There's Davy Elk, a college-educated Indian, fully assimilated into white society, who still encounters prejudice from the whites. There's Running Buffalo, an old comic Indian who wanders throughout the picture asking, where's the whiskey? And then there is a Comanche chief, Puma, portrayed by Australian actor Michael Pate, who had played Victorio in Hondo. The US Army wants to move the Comanche to a distant Oklahoma reservation. Puma and the other Comanche chiefs asked McClinic to plead their case before the governor and the military. McClinic reads from a page given him by the chiefs. We are an old people and a proud people. When the white man first came among us, we were as many as the grasses of the prairie. Now we are few, but we are still proud for if a man loses pride in manhood, he is nothing. You tell us now that if we will let you send us away to this place called Fort Sill, you will feed us and care for us. Well, let us tell you this. It is the Comanche law that no chief ever eats unless first he sees that the pots are full of meat in the lodges of the widows and orphans. It is the Comanche way of life. This that the white man calls charity is a fine thing for widows and orphans, but no warrior can accept it. For if he does, he is no longer a man, and when he is no longer a man, he is nothing. He's better off dead. You say to the Comanche, you are widows and orphans, you are not men. And we, the Comanche, say, we would rather be dead. It will not be a remembered fight when you kill us, because we are few now and have few weapons. But we will fight, and we will die Comanche. 
Now that speech is kind of similar to the words Cochise told Colonel Thursday in Fort Apache. And unfortunately, it falls on similarly deaf ears. The irate governor orders the chief's immediate incarceration until time for their removal to the reservation. The clinic helps arrange the escape of the chiefs. They gallop away with the cavalry in close pursuit. Puma is leading his last war party, someone tells McClinic. Well, they won't get very far, McClinic responds sadly. But the pathos of the scene is quickly mitigated by the picture erupting into a boisterous comic climax. Cheyenne Autumn, released the following year, 64, was reported to be John Ford's apology to the Indians. It's a tragic story about a band of starving Cheyenne who escaped their reservation in the southwestern desert and attempt to cross 1,400 miles of land to return to their native homelands in the northern U.S. All the while they're hounded by the U.S. cavalry. Well, unfortunately, Indian critics protested that the lead Cheyenne roles were given to two Mexicans, Ricardo Montalban and Gilbert Rowland, and to Sal Minio, who was born in the Bronx. A Man Called Horse, released in May, of 1970, told of an English aristocrat, John Morgan, portrayed by Richard Harris, who's captured by the Sioux. After brutal treatment as a slave, he assimilates into the tribe and becomes their leader. The picture was praised for its balanced approach to the Indians, certainly not as romanticized as Kevin Costner's later Dances with Wolves. But again, there were non-Indian actors including Dame Judith Anderson playing Indian roles. We were in Vietnam in 1970, and a radical reaction against the military was reflected in some of the pictures made at that time, sometimes to the benefit of the Indians. Pictures such as Soldier Blue, a completely one-sided story in which all the Indians are good and all the whites are evil except for the two principals, played by Candace Bergen and Peter Strauss. The most effective scene in the picture is the brutal portrayal of the Sand Creek Massacre, which occurred when white men attacked a Cheyenne village of mostly women and children. Well, that time the white men were the bad guys. And in December of that same year, 1970, little big man hit the screen. This picture provided an Indian perspective of both the Battle of the Washita, pretty similar to the Sand Creek Massacre, and the Battle of the Little Bighorn. More important was its portrayal of daily Indian life in the Cheyenne Village. Although Dustin Hoffman starred, Chief Dan George, a real Indian, won an Oscar nomination and stole the picture with his portrayal of old lodge skins. Now, lastly, I'm going to mention Dances with Wolves, released in 1990. Picture provides a poetic view of the Lakota from the perspective of a white man, Lieutenant Dunbar, played by the director, Kevin Costner. Real Canadian Indian Graham Greene takes top honors for his portrayal of the medicine man, Kicking Bird. But the picture's message is again undermined by the totally negative portrayal of the other whites. They shoot Dunbar's beloved buckskin and his pet wolf. Dunbar himself is captured, beaten, and chained. The Lakota help him escape, but everyone knows. Well, it's only a temporary reprieve for both Dunbar and the Lakota. As I said in Hondo, it's the end of a way of life, and a good one. Now that's about the size of it. So what do you think?
Do you think the Hollywood has really portrayed the Indians in a negative light? What do you think? Oh, that's your turn. See, that was a question. They told me you were a live audience. I don't think that's funny. There must be life out there somewhere. But you're looking for a yes or no, or whatever. And, and I... Don't put words in my mouth. <laughs> you're an armed guy. You've got two arms. Uh, you do, too. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, any, any comments or reactions? I mean, I, let's first applause. Uh, what a, what a remarkable you, you know, I, you know, I've seen all those John Wayne movies. I've never seen him so thoughtful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, no, but seriously, that was just a, a, what a way of looking at film and, and the characters. And a lot of the films that you mentioned are ones I really hadn't thought about in so many years. Uh, Any comments, reactions? Uh, yes. It's Hollywood's job to sell tickets. Well, that's the bottom line. We're not talking about documentaries here. This isn't the History Channel. <laughs> but it's also a reflection of all of us. And I think that's what's uh, really fascinating in what we have all seen. Because we're the ones buying the tickets. We're the audience. And, and so any, any other observations? You know, one more thing. A lot of these pictures are as much reflections of our society at the time as they are of the stories they're telling. Yeah, one, one, 